Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first three months of 2014. Um, and this series of lessons is called Discipleship. And this is lesson number six in that series for February 8 of 2014. And it's entitled, Discipling the Ordinary. Now you might have a question in your mind what ordinary means, so we'll get to that in just a moment. But before we do, I hope you've got your Bible in hand, and we're going to offer a word of prayer for God's guidance. Our loving Father, we, we thank you for the example you set up for us in the Gospels. What a marvelous way you did that, and there's so many things we can learn from your example. Help us now to learn something about how you related to different types of people. And may we follow your example as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this lesson is about the ministry of Jesus and discipling ordinary people. There are many stories about his ministries to fishermen, farmers, housewives, shepherds, soldiers, even servants. Why do you think Jesus seemed to focus on those people instead of on the rich and famous? Why? I mean, just think how, I mean, if Jesus had just convinced the Jewish leaders that he was the kind of person they needed to follow, wouldn't the whole nation have followed him? Shouldn't, wouldn't that have been a better approach? I don't think they had any needs that needed to be fulfilled, needed to be... They thought they were doing just fine, huh? Yeah, so they, they were rich and had need of nothing. And the fact that they were rich proved that they were God followers, that they were good people. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Old Testament tells us that. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> what kind of authority did Jesus appeal to in his many times of reaching out to people? The Old Testament? Yeah. It he is used, written? He used logic. He would say, oh. here's a verse from the Old Testament. Think about how it applies. Think about how it should apply. And then he would, he would apply it. And, and, and what was the result? Even the poor heard him gladly, huh? Because it wasn't, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says this, and, and that might, they might seem to contradict, but that's all right, Rabbi so-and-so said this, and we're going to pull this together, and we, we think that this, and this, and this, and what do you think? And also, Jesus wanted the ordinary people to understand, and he mm -hmm. didn't say, this is above you, don't, don't bother with it, we're the only ones that can understand the Bible. It's, you know, when you appeal to the lower class, mm -hmm. you end up appealing to everybody. If you go to the higher class, then the lower class will wonder if they were included. That's interesting that you should say that because Ellen White, in a few places, suggests that we ought to approach the higher class first because it's harder to reach them after you've already started working with the lower class. She says you should start with them first and then they will in turn, uh, you know, because nobody was, has a particular problem with join, joining a group with, that's a little bit higher than they are. So, In our school district, and I think in business too, we always said any kind of program that started at the grassroots never got anywhere unless the top wanted it. I mean, a program could go from top down, mm -hmm. but to go from the teachers up was an impossible task. So Jesus really started with impossible. You don't really get something going unless you have the leaders buying into it. Mm -hmm. But well. still though, if, if a person, say that, that history, history showed that Jesus went to the high people first, mm -hmm. wouldn't it go all the way through to our time that there would be people saying that Oh, you know, I'm just an uneducated, yeah. low person. I'm, I don't have any money. You know, what help? What hope do I have? And all that. Yeah. Uh, that would just. That's another. That would be a problem. Side of it. Yeah. Other yeah. side of the coin. You talk the language that the people could understand. Yeah. And it was there were real life stories, or it, it, they could relate 
real life to stories to, or to his stories. What, what 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 information do we have about the the family that Jesus belonged to? They were poor. He had several brothers, some sisters. Mm -hmm. They were poor. Okay, and the brothers and sisters were how were they related to Jesus? Half brothers, half sisters. Not even half, really. <laughs> Okay. Well, I mean, if well, you think they, about it, they, well, yeah. it, they, it, was they a, didn't share it was a blended family. That's right. It was they, Joseph was their father, and Mary was Jesus' mother, but that was the end of the relationship. Were there any after? No, not that we know like of. Like the Brady Bunch? I guess so. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> what? okay, what is the evidence that Jesus' family was poor? Didn't they bring... A dove or something at a when it came time think about this they brought the king of the universe to dedicate him at the temple and they could only afford two turtle doves as an offering and that was the lowest of low offerings. that's the lowest of the low offerings yes okay what else um, can what else made you think that they, that, that they belong to a, a not so ritzy family. I can think of another thing that would. Born Jesus. in a manger. Yeah, certainly his birth story. I mean, born in a stable and, and laid in a manger where they feed the cows and the donkeys. I mean, that's a. And Jesus had to work. He was a carpenter. Yeah. His father was a carpenter, which means he wasn't a rabbi. Okay, that's pretty clear, right? Um, by the way, just, just to touch on the Old Testament background for this so that we people know where this came from. Look at Leviticus 12 verse 8. If the woman cannot afford, and that's talking about a woman after she's given birth, if a woman cannot afford a lamb, she shall bring two doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall perform the ritual to take away her impurity and she will be ritually clean. So that's pretty clear, isn't it? They couldn't even bring anything except two but wasn't Dust. there also some meal offerings, not even animal offerings? For some things, you could bring flour. Yeah, yeah. that was for sin offerings. Okay. I don't think that was appropriate for for uh, for a newborn boy. Well, so this comment from Ellen White: the parents of Jesus were poor and dependent upon their daily toil. He was familiar with poverty self-denial and privation. This experience was a safeguard to him. Think about our young people today. How would, they, how would they respond to this? In his industrious life, there were no idle moments to invite temptation or play on their iPad. No, it didn't say that. Did <laughs> no aimless hours opened the way for corrupting associations. So far as possible, he closed the door to the tempter. Neither gain nor pleasure Applause nor censure could induce him to consent to a wrong act. He was wise to discern evil and strong to resist it. Desire of Ages, page 72. Well, it really is beyond our comprehension to think that the creator of the entire universe would choose to become a human being, and not only that, but also to be born as an infant in a stable, laid in a manger, and so forth. It's just, you know, I, it's, it's, I just can't take that in, really. Um, People that believe in reincarnation, they never say they're going to come back as someone poor. They always think they're going to come back as something better. Jesus came down here and, and was born in a manger. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two stories that this, this lesson focuses on considerably. The first one is found in John 2, verses 1 to 11. Let's take a moment. This is a familiar story again. Two days later, there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine had given out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine left. Why do you suppose she's concerned with that, and why did, you, why did she ask Jesus? Is she the wedding coordinator? Well, obviously, it was the family wedding. There clearly were relatives. And so they felt responsible. I mean, what happens if you run out of, you know, the major drink and right in the middle of the celebration? That's not, not too I quiet. think in context, though, didn't Jesus first leave? 
he, and this he'd is gone. the first time that he's come back to mm -hmm. see her, his mother mm -hmm. after he left for the first time mm -hmm. on his his uh, missionary right his ministry his pre ministry so she might have got a clue, clue right there that um, something could happen here. That's a possibility. Well, it's strange that she would say to Jesus, they have no wine left, as if she knew he, he could do something to correct it. Now, I, yes. But she have, may have been in the habit of going to Jesus to fix whatever problem she had. That's what I think oh. is the major story. I mean, Joseph is dead, and Mary has just gotten to the place where, I mean, any problem she has, she mentions it to Jesus, and he figures out a solution. Mm. So, I mean, what does she do when they've got no wine? And they, well, ask Jesus. He'll, he'll figure it out, right? So this, this was a request that was probably doable by anybody? No, not not doable by anybody. But I think she just had gotten to the re, gotten to the place. You where think it was a big habit. You don't think she was frustrated because all her life she's had this Messiah that she knew about that was born by no father, mm -hmm. that was told by the angel what he was going to be, and he finally left and he came back, and she knew that something could happen at that point. Finally, I don't think she <laughs> had the foggiest notion that he was going to make. 300 gallons of wine. But he knew who he, she was. He was. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was, was special. See, the next sentence is, Jesus says, you must not tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. So he interpreted they have no wine left as an order from his mm -hmm. mother. Yeah. Yeah. My time has okay. not yet come. And what does his mother do? She is, which now that she's told Jesus, she says, okay, he'll figure it out. Just turns to the servant and says, do whatever he tells you. Well, it turns out that there were six stone jars sitting by the door. And what was the purpose of those jars? Ceremonial wash. They were places when you walked in, came into the house, if you came back from the market, you were expected to go through a fairly elaborate washing process because you might have come in contact with the Gentile down there at the market. And these were large water bottles. And so, how much water was in those bottles? Do you remember? It was like 50. Mm -hmm. I, I, no, you're, you're I don't. You're covering it. says large enough to hold about 100 liters. Yeah, each one. Yeah. Each one large enough to hold about 100 quarts or so forth. So, 600 quarts is how much? Those are huge jars. They are. So each jar. A almost about 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 a half of an oil drum, mm. each one of these jars. Well, that must have been some task to fill these jars with water. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, this is a lot of wine. And we are sure that it was unfermented wine. Um, so what, what was Jesus trying? This was Jesus's, keep in mind now, this is the first recorded miracle. The first one. Okay. Now, if there was something that happened before that, but, but John specifically says it was, a, well, look at the end of the story. He just says this is the first of the signs. I come way down here. I have yeah. a chemistry teacher friend who's now retired, and he says grape juice is wonderful, and he told his chemistry students, and they proved it, that wine is nothing more than the urine of yeast. Yeah. The alcohol is. The alcohol part is, yes. That's true. So, so when you're drinking wine, think of what you're drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here, here, look at this. Verse 11, Jesus performed this first miracle in Cana and Galilee. There he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. It's interesting that if you go on to Ellen White, what did Jesus do? They turned around he was gone. He had disappeared. And so now the disciples had to say, well, everybody turned to them. What do you know about this guy? What, what, how, how did he do this? And so what did they have to do? They had to witness. Okay, the other story is found in Matthew 15, verses uh, 32 here, and I'm all of a sudden 
start with verse 32. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel sorry for these people. Now this is a story of, of the feeding of the 4,000 in pagan territory, Gentile territory. I feel sorry for these people because they have been with me for three days and now have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away without feeding them for they might faint on their way home. The disciples asked him, where will we find enough food in this desert to feed this crowd? How much bread have you? Jesus asked. Seven loaves, they answered, and a few small fish. So Jesus ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, gave thanks to God, and broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and had enough. Then the disciples took up seven baskets full of pieces left over. The number of men who ate was 4,000, not counting the women and children. So, what do we learn in that story about the ordinary? Uh, Jesus cared for their um, physical needs. Yep. Whether it's unfermented wine, whether it's food, Jesus recognized their needs. One of the stories that's not mentioned here is the story of the raising of Jairus' daughter. And what, is, what did Jesus say to them before he left the room? Eat her. Give her something to eat. He's been sick for a long time. Give her something to eat. This was a dangerous miracle for Jesus to perform this feeding of the 4,000. It was feeding of the 5,000 a short time before that they wanted to make him king. Mm -hmm. And he had to send them all away. And, uh, you know, he's taking a chance here. Mm -hmm. About being king again? About people trying to make him king. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know how many times do we ask the question, you know, in our own lives, you know, um, what do we have to give, you know, yeah. and especially when it's almost possible to do it, but you can't quite do it, let alone 5,000 people when you've got nothing there except those little fish and a couple of loaves, you know. Someone's lunch. Right. One person's right. lunch. One person's lunch. How are you going to go... And, and the disciples asked that question. How are we going to do that with this? You know, or how are we going to feed these people? This oh, way? But not only that, they, they, they were comfortable in feeding all, uh, the Jews. 5,000 Jews are on their way to the... And it's interesting because, uh, you know, the, 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 the Bible doesn't comment about this, but it implies that this huge crowd was on their way to Passover. Okay, if you're setting out on a journey with a big group of people, and you're planning to walk for a week to get to Passover, do you go without any food? No. No, not at all. Now, over here, the feeding of the 4,000, we talked about this last week. Here he is in pagan territory. They're not going anywhere. They've come out just to see Jesus, and they're so captivated by what he has to say and what he's doing and so forth that they're, they're just goggle-eyed at what's going on here for three, days. for three days and what's happened after three days I had to I had to fast one time for three days as part of a chemistry experiment and I, I thought I was going to die yeah. <laughs> fortunately you didn't I, fortunately I didn't <laughs> well did Jesus get in trouble for feeding 4,000 uh, non-Jewish people well what about that the disciples thought it was fine for him to feed 5,000 Jews but 4,000 pagans? 4,000 Gentiles? What are we doing with these people out here? I always wondered why they had the same reaction after the second time. Because they, they saw this happen the first time. Yeah. It might be because they kind of wanted to get out of it. Yeah. Because they were Gentiles. Yeah. But I don't know that for sure. Well, look at Mark 1, verses 16 to 20. As Jesus walked along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw two fishermen. Simon and his brother Andrew catching fish with a net. Jesus said to them, Come with me and I will teach you to catch people. At once they left their nets and went with him. He went a little further on and saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in their boat getting their nets ready. As soon as Jesus saw them, he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and went with Jesus. Now they have had to have known about Jesus because just to have a Jesus come up and say, come with me. So, Okay, so what do we know about the history? This is a good year into their 
partial association with him. Oh. Okay. To begin with, there are many who believe, many scholars believe that James and John were actually cousins of Jesus. We, we, there's no proof of that, but there's some hints at it. So that may be, they may have known Jesus from the time he was a small child. We don't know. That's, that one, maybe. I'll just say a maybe. But who were his first disciples that he called right after the, the, the temptations in the wilderness, after his baptism, the temptations in the wilderness? Who? Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Well, and Philip and Nathaniel, so forth. And what, what, when was that? Do we know the dating? That Jesus' baptism happened in the fall of A.D. 27. He's now beginning his Galilean ministry in the spring of A.D. 29. A year and a half has gone by, and they, they have followed Jesus, not consistently, but some here, some there, sometimes they're with him, sometimes they're not with him, and they're not quite sure what to make of him. Because... They realize he has incredible powers. He can do miracles. He can do all kinds of things. And they know about his charisma and so forth like this. And they know perfectly well that if he would just announce that he was going to be the king of the Jews and do what the Jews expected the Messiah to do, he would be, he would be king just like that. They knew that. And what had happened, a year and a half had gone by, and where was Jesus? He was still walking by himself along the Sea of Galilee, They had just about given up on Jesus. His ministry hadn't taken off like they expected. And why not? He prevented it. That's right. He specifically prevented it. And they couldn't understand that. Well, as Jesus walked along the beach, what do we know if, and now I'm, I'm cheating by bringing in material from Ellen White, he's walking along, it's early in the morning, he's walking along the beach, and, who he, who, and what are these disciples doing? Now, they're not disciples yet, officially. They've been fishing all night. Uh, and what happened? They caught nothing, and so now they're cleaning their nets. Okay. And, uh, and kind of listening. They, why are they out fishing? Because they've given up on Jesus, according to Ellen White. They were just about to say, as much as we believe in this guy, he's, he's, he's not get, he doesn't have his act together. Well, and nothing's so, happening. Nothing's happening. Not what they wanted. Yeah. The thing, what they wanted was not happening. Right. Okay, that's, I guess that's a better way to say it. So, now, Jesus, be, he, he comes along the beach, and pretty soon there's a big crowd gathering. And what's Peter and Andrew and James and John doing? They're cleaning their, their fishing nets. From the night before. From the night before. How much have they caught? Nothing. So now they're choosing between, would we want to follow Jesus or we want to fish all night and get nothing? <laughs> and it also says in there, like reading your notes, yeah. they were uh, talking about what would happen to them if they joined the G ministry yeah. of Jesus because John the Baptist had recently been arrested, imprisoned, and maybe had his head chopped off. Jesus left his ministry in Judea and went to Galilee because John was imprisoned. It was a little while. It was a little while later that his head was that he was you know, he was uh, beheaded. But and look what happens to you when you follow Jesus. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. This this could be a dangerous sport. Yeah. yeah. So it looks like this beginning ministry didn't wasn't just a fall off a log type no, of thing. No, not at all. Yeah. You know. These people had known Jesus very well already. So Jesus, what, what happens to Jesus? He starts talking because people are following. He starts healing people, I'm sure. And then pretty soon he's talking to them. And pretty soon they're crowding him. And like almost, you know, you can imagine, here's a bunch of people trying to push their sick up. You know, heal my guy, heal my guy, heal my guy. And Jesus is being pushed right into the water. So what does he do? Gets on a boat. He gets, climbs into Peter's boat and says, could you push out a little bit? So he did. And so now there's a, there's a, semicircular kind of a thing on a hillside going up from the, from the lake. And so Jesus is, has a sort of natural amphitheater and he's talking to the people and it's very convenient. And now he's in a boat so they can't, they can't interrupt him with getting, trying to get their stuff, people healed all the time. And so now they're listening. And so it goes on for a while and then what happens? Oh, we're in nets. Peter and Andrew are still cleaning their nets as far as we know. 
James and John up up the up the uh, edge of the lake a little bit, within distance, I'm sure. They were also still cleaning their nets. Why weren't they there trying to help Jesus? They had nets that needed cleaning. And they weren't sure they, they were ready to follow Jesus. Yeah. And so what does Jesus do? Convinces them. He, he tells them <laughs> he can, to he convinces them, yeah. put their clean nets back into the water to try to catch some fish. And they thought Jesus was nuts. Okay. So now they're out there with their nets, apparently, a little way offshore. And Jesus says, in the middle of the day, bright sunshine, here's these big heavy nets. And Jesus says, put the nets into the water. And you never fished in the bright day sunlight, huh? The fish can see the nets. They're not stupid. Okay. And what happened? They filled their IRA account. <laughs> yeah, right. The catch they, was unbelievable. They, they couldn't hardly pull up the nets. There were so many fish in them. And what do you say about um, this carpenter who's telling you how to fish when you're a fisherman? Or maybe <laughs> you think all the fish obey this man and swam into our net? Can you imagine Jesus saying fish swim into the net? Well, imagine today what might someone have said if that happened to them. Hey, Jesus, you, let's you and I go into partnership. I'll yeah, provide yeah. the nets. I'll provide the boat. You tell me where to fish and, and we'll be rich. Well, you can kind of put yourself in their shoes. They probably wondered if Jesus, being around Jesus was really worth it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should be out fishing. So they fish all night. Nothing happens. They don't get anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then they clean their nets. And then Jesus comes, gets in their boat, and all of a sudden, all this stuff happens. Mm -hmm. So is it a waste of time to follow him? Well, <laughs> obviously it isn't. No. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that and Jesus... That's why Jesus, by Peter fell down and asked for forgiveness, actually, yep. for even thinking the way he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Very significant part of the story. They had been complete. They, they they just realized that their their thoughts, their discussions on that line were completely foolish. I mean, here's someone who can control the forces of nature, even tell the fish where to swim. Mm -hmm. I mean, any of you ever tried telling fish where to swim? <laughs> or he could have created a bunch of fish to even that. Uh -huh. So, I mean, to a group of fishermen who had been fishing their lives on that sea, and now this happens to them, I mean, you know, they, they were just blown away. I'm sure they had, did, could not believe what had happened. They probably figured they're not going to ever have to be hungry. No. No. Well, look at Mark 6, verse 3. And you really need to back up a little bit to verse 1 to get the story. Jesus left that place and went back to his hometown. Now, the hometown was Nazareth, right? Followed by his disciples. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many people were there, and when they heard him, they were all amazed. Where did he get all this? They asked. What wisdom is this that had been, has been given him? He does, how does he perform miracles? Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother... By the way, notice at this point in time, they're not calling him the son of the carpenter. Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters living here? And so they rejected him. Why do you think they rejected him? I mean, why didn't they give him, I mean, here, here's the hometown hero. Why didn't they give him a big welcome? Jealousy. We know him. He was no better than us. What, what, what's going on here? What kind of status did a carpenter have in that town? Low? Not very high. Mm. Not very high. And the whole town didn't have very high status, did it? If he had become king, they would have accepted him. Oh, yeah. And they were looking for him to come home and perform lots of miracles for them. Well, that was the big deal, it looks like, the miracles. Mm -hmm. And so if he didn't want to do that. Well, then they only had his, this old carpenter now. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, exactly. Well, 
Jesus eventually chose 12 disciples, or did he? 11. He chose 11. And who decided to join them? Judas. Judas. Jesus didn't actually choose Judas. He allowed him to join them. Is that all he chose? Hmm. Or were there others who joined him? Look at Luke 8, verses 1 to 3, just as an interesting side light. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through the towns and villages, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, we know about them, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. I, I you know. So those weren't ordinary people, those were some rich people. Yeah, and rich what kind of people? Rich arist aristocrats. Women. And they were women. What kind of a... Oh. They were out spending their <laughs> husband's money. Out spending their husband's <laughs> money. But that was really why, what was so important about that. The fact that there were women and they were mentioned here mm -hmm. uh, must have meant that it was a big deal back then okay, to have all typical, these women. A typical rabbi teaching students in that setting would have what kind of followers? Only yeah. men. Only young boys or, or men following. Only. Girls were not supposed to get education. They weren't, they weren't considered to be a part of the followers of rabbi at all. And now here's a bunch of rich women hanging around with Jesus and his disciples. I wonder what villages who maybe didn't know they were coming, and all of a sudden Jesus shows up with these disciples and these rich women. I wonder how they responded. Well, look who records the story. Yeah. It's Luke. He's, mm -hmm. he's not Jewish. No, he's not Jewish. <laughs> Luke is the book that uh, covered all the women Yes. In, in the Bible stories. In fact, he is so favorable to women, Luke and the book of Acts as well, those two books are so favorable to women that a lot of the early church, early church members didn't want to accept these books as part of the New Testament because mm -hmm. they're way too favorable to women and to marriage. And to Gentiles. And to Gentiles, yeah. Women and marriage? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, here's some interesting comments by another woman, Ellen White. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen. Meaning what? What does unlearned fishermen mean? They did not go to school. They didn't go to the rabbi school. Oh, the rabbi school. Because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. They were men of native ability, and they were humble and teachable men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there is many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he, is, that he possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Do you remember that story in Acts 4? Peter and John were in, had been imprisoned and they were being brought before the Sanhedrin in, in, uh, in, uh, you know, to be tried. And Jesus, you know, he just, he just opened on <laughs> I mean, I, it's, it's, this is, I, I just have to chuckle when I re read it. You know, look at Acts 4. Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, I'm reading from verse 8. Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, answered them, Leaders of the people and elders, if we are being questioned today about the good deed done to the lame man, this is after they'd healed the lame man that sat at the beautiful gate, and how he was healed, then you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know, he wants everybody to know, that this man stands here before you completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from, death, from the dead, from death. I mean, he is just blowing them away. Jesus is the one whom the scripture says, the stone that you, the builders, despised turned out to be the most important of all. Salvation is to be found through him alone. Not all your teachings and all your crazy ideas. 
In all the world, there's no one else whom God has given who can save us. And what was their response? The members of the council, now this is Congress, okay? This is the Congress of their day. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they, had, they were ordinary men of no education. Were they ordinary men according to Ellen White? Not at all. But they didn't have a rabbinic education. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. And that's the end of the story. Even you though they you don't were... don't need to say any more. Even though they were non-educated, they still had the problem sometimes of wanting to be the greatest. Yeah. And they, they were educated by the best rabbi in the whole area. <laughs> But yeah. they still had the paradigm that the that the rabbis of the country had. Yes. That Jesus was well, that the Messiah was going to come and deliver them from the Romans. So now let's let's come to some of the really challenging questions of this lesson. Why do you think the poor were so much more willing to accept Jesus than the wealthy and influential? Now we're going to talk about the wealthy and influential in the lessons coming up. But right now, we're focusing on the fact that Jesus spent most of his time talking to the poor. He performed miracles mostly for the, not, not actually, I mean, Jairus' daughter was wealthy, you know. Well, Lazarus was probably wealthy. They had, they had needs. Uh, they, they recognized their poverty, and he offered them hope and the promise of a better life. Well, you know, the rich were winning the Monopoly game. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want Jesus to come and move their parts and, and uh, upset um, go to jail, the go rules to jail, of society that had put them in leadership. Yeah. And uh, Jesus was kind of shaking up things. Uh, look at Matthew 16. What happens here? Jesus went to the territory near the town of Caesarea Philippi where he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And I... I'm sorry, I probably should have had myself a little better organized. I have pictures of all these places because I had the privilege of visiting them this past summer. I could show you a picture of Caesarea Philippi, well, the ruins of it. Some say John the Baptist, they answered. Others say Elijah, while others say Jeremiah or some other prophet. And why are they mentioning those people? Well, they knew those people were of God. Yeah, but that's not the only reason. There are hints in, each, in the stories of each one of those people that they might come back. Oh. So people say, well, maybe. Maybe he's coming, one of those people come back. And what about you, he asked them. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Good for you, Simon, son of John, answered Jesus. For this truth did not come to you from any human being, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. How do you suppose that happened? Yes, Dennis. I want to go back to your question as to why they followed Jesus so readily, the common people. So I want to ask, uh, was the ruling class, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, mm -hmm. imposing some burden on them that, uh, that Jesus was, in a sense, relieving? Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess to ask the question, I, I think of one answer, you know, if you're rich, you're, you're blessed of God. If you're poor, you're, you're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And For one thing, they felt put down on. They felt like they were worthless, ho hopeless, and so forth. I, I think of a, an example of Dr. Provencia, who was one of my former teachers, and he, he went to, he, he, he visited Sri Lanka, um, and... Provencia, it might have been one of my other teachers, but I think it was Provencia. And he was traveling with this, uh, with the, the head of the Adventist church in, in Sri Lanka a number of years ago. And, you know, they were driving down one of these streets and, you know, India and Sri Lanka, you know, just people everywhere hanging out of stuff and you can hardly move your vehicle because there's people walking and animals walking and this kind of stuff. And he turned to this Adventist pastor and he said, what 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 do you do with this tremendous number of people? How are we going to ever reach all these people? And you know what the Adventist, the head of the Adventist church in Sri Lanka said to him? 
I try not to think about it. Because it would be too discouraging? Yeah. Yeah. So, Isn't he being paid to think about it? <laughs> we kind of thought so. <laughs> well, so how do you suppose this message came to Peter, that this is the Messiah? The Holy Spirit. Okay, but do you have Holy Spirit giving you ideas? Well, the Holy Spirit helps put things together in your mind. Okay. I mean, you can look at you look at Jesus, what he's done in the past, and what you knew about the Messiah, and it could help you put it together. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that you have an answer for this? Well, I, I, I think of a later time in Peter's life when he said, Jesus, I am with you, 100%, even if I have to die with you. Okay, what? so he could have just been saying something that he really didn't believe. I, I think he said something he didn't really understand what he was saying. It was way beyond him. I think I think the Holy Spirit was touched him. I think he was impressed right at that moment. And people do this quite regularly. People, you know, they're moved by something and they'll say yes. And that was Peter. Mm -hmm. And later they, well, no, I didn't. I wasn't quite prepared for all the consequences of what I just said. Uh -huh. Well, what happened to Peter after he turned out and turned around and denied Jesus three times? Ellen White says he ran out. He didn't even know where he was going. He just ran and ran. Suddenly he realized he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he went over to the place where Jesus had knelt and prayed and fell down and wished that he could die. Is that what Satan wished also, that Peter would die so that sure. he wouldn't be the leader of the church coming up? Mm -hmm. By the way, you will be interested to know that uh, we've just had a proclamation from the... Um, Catholic Church in Rome that they have been digging around in the basement of the cathedral there and they came up with a little thing with bones in it and they have declared officially that these are the bones of Peter. Oh. Yeah. That was announced this week. Mm -hmm. No no proof. Just to Well, they 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 don't they, they, they don't someone asked them whether they needed to do some uh, some DNA some carbon 14 dating he said no, we don't need that. The, the, the Holy Father said these are Peter's bones. That's it. Well, How as did we, Peter die? What? How did Peter die? He was crucified upside down in Rome. Okay. So it's not completely impossible, but yeah, it is really impossible. <laughs> well, would they collect a crucified person's bones or would they toss them out? Well... If you, if you visit Rome and you go out to the edge of Rome and you go down into the area called the catacombs where Christians, many of them, survived the persecution for years and years, hiding down in tunnels down there. They just go all around under Rome and you, they, they big warning signs down there, do not go any further down this path because people have disappeared down there and never came back because there's so many down underneath the Rome. And if you, there are places, now I visited there for the first time and the only time actually, many, many years ago, but they will show you a place we, we think P, Paul was buried here and we think Peter was buried over here. And uh, little cut out places in the side of the... Well, they have to have something to show all those tourists coming yeah, over. Yeah, right. So, well, um, look at some other places, Luke 12, 6 and 7. How much does Jesus know about us? Aren't we ordinary people? Around, aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one sparrow was forgotten by God. Even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth much more than many sparrows. And there's other, other verses. Uh, chapter 13, 1 to 5, and Matthew 6, 25 to 30, all say basically the same thing. Yes. When I was young and heard and read this statement, mm -hmm. I said, what useless information for God to collect, the number of hairs on our head. Mm -hmm. But if we really expect God to resurrect us in the likeness 
which we demise, mm -hmm. he might need to know mm -hmm. how many hairs are on Yeah. And then a lot of other details. Yes. Yes. Well, it's interesting that he goes on, in, we get over to Galatians, and Paul says, what? Are we extraordinary? Are you ordinary? It really doesn't matter because ignorant, ignorant or educated, male or female, slave or free, Gentile or Jew, what? You're all part of the same family. Galatians 3.28. In fact, Ellen White said, Christ would have died for one soul in order that that one might live through eternal ages. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 73. Elsewhere, she said, one soul saved in the kingdom of God is worth more than 10,000 worlds like this. Review and Herald, April 1, 1880, paragraph 1. It's pretty amazing statements, really. Well, how did the Christian church grow after Pentecost when they, Jesus was no longer with them? Quickly. Rapidly. I mean, 3,000 people born in the first you know, day, and pretty soon there's 5,000 more, and it just... And what did they do there in Jerusalem? as it was growing like that. You remember? Formed a commune, didn't they? It was like a commune. They would eat in people's houses. They would go to the temple. When you walked in to the front door of the temple, well, there's actually two ways you could go into the temple, but in the main gate, the front of the temple, there was a long sort of porch that was partially covered there. And they just sort of commandeered that, that territory. And they started talking about Jesus. And people, people flocking into the temple would, would hear them and say, oh, well, what's going on over here? And, I mean, people were just joining them like you wouldn't believe. It was amazing. And, like you said, they, they sold what they had. They provided food. And uh, there was... There were several reasons why it grew. Can you think of some reasons? For one, many of those converts had heard and seen Jesus and were impressed by his work. Many of them were probably also healed by him. So the, the 3,000 that were baptized on Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, probably were people who already had a pretty good working knowledge of Jesus and what he was teaching. Well, and Jesus was teaching things that made the Old Testament clear, mm -hmm. understandable, and they, uh, the people got the aha experience. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was explaining and the disciples was explaining the Bible. Well, and the early Christians treated everyone equally, believe it or not. They met together in homes and even in the temple and everyone, no matter what his social standing, was welcome. They even sold property to help support the entire group. This kind of open fellowship was almost irresistible. I mean, think of the, the, the society, all the the categories and classes and so forth. You know, we, uh, we, Jesus told the story of the uh, uh, Good Samaritan. And do you, have you read what Ellen White said about that in Desire of Ages? Anybody remember having read it recently? She suggested that people were there in the audience. That, yes. That. No, but not only that, the Jewish leaders particularly, but even the whole group of Jews, used to spend endless hours arguing about who is my brother. Now, you know, I, I wouldn't, if I'm a Pharisee, would I consider a Sadducee my brother? And certainly I wouldn't consider the, the hoi polloi, as the Greek would call them, the ordinary people, brothers. And then he goes to tell the story about the Samaritan. And he says, and who was the brother? <laughs> you know, Jesus, I, I have to chuckle. He was so clever, you know. He just boxed people in and they, had, they were forced to admit the thing which they should have admitted at the beginning. Who was a brother to this guy? Well, maybe it was the guy who was kind to him. Not even mentioning that, of course, he was a Samaritan. So do so, I dare say that uh, the early Christians redistributed wealth? Yes. And? Yeah, but it was their choice. They didn't really. They, <laughs> they didn't did it really. on their. Oh, it didn't. wasn't. It wasn't the government. That yeah, was it wasn't doing the government it. saying and well, putting no up a law. Taking a piece of it. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's important because 
they gave everyone according to his needs. What you need right now. This wasn't, okay, let me give you a whole bunch of money. You can do what you like with it. And you have some more money and do what you like with it. No, this wasn't really a redistribution of wealth. It was meeting the needs of the people. So how are we doing, how well are we doing at that kind of open fellowship today in our churches? Well, there must be a tendency not to do that. Because... Huh? In our churches? Well, even back then, I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was happening and people were just saying that, you know, yeah. these people love each other and all that. But it didn't go forever. I mean, they disappeared after a while. So there must be something that makes you want to get out of that situation even though it's a perfect thing. Yeah. Well, of course, they got out of that situation because there was an incredible persecution that started and Christians just scattered, went in every direction. I think whenever anything is going good, Satan tries yeah. to mess it up. Yeah. Well, look at these words from the, the Apostle John in his little book, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16. Not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. Rich people who see a brother or sister in need yet close their hearts against them cannot claim that they love God. My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. That's a pretty mm. indicting statement, isn't it? Yes, it, yes is. it is. Do we ever close our hearts against the poor? Especially when uh, you think they're drunks and standing by the corner and so forth. Well, how many of us have been guilty of thinking that the work of spreading the gospel is the pastor's work? Well, in this closing work of the gospel, there's a vast field to be occupied. And more than ever before, the work is to enlist helpers from the common people. Would those be the ordinary? Presumably, huh? Both the youth and those older in years will be called from the field, from the vineyard, and from the workshop, and sent forth by the master to give his message. Is that talking about our day? In the day of when Jerusalem was being rebuilt... Nehemiah was the one that finally got it rebuilt yeah. and finally got things going. Yeah. Now, Nehemiah, was Nehemiah a common person? Well, he was a lay he, he was appointed to a high position, but he originally was a slave of the king. Okay. So, Nehemiah's will finish the work. The common yeah. people will finish the work. Mm -hmm. He was a slave of the Babylonian king. Yeah. Yeah, we're not what not certain of what his Jewish status well, was. Well, well, yes, we are. He was appointed to be governor of Judea. The the king said, you know, you need to get something done. You go back. I'm giving you authority. So, even though they were a relatively small group of people back then, he shows up. He's the boss, according to the emperor. Well, so both the youth and those older in years will be called from the field, from the vineyard, and from the workshop, and sent forth by the master to give his message. Many of these have had little opportunity for education, but Christ sees in them qualifications that will enable them to fulfill his purpose. If they put their hearts into the work and continue to be learners, he will fit them to labor for him. Educations, pages 269 and 270. You think that might apply to any of us? Well, it looks like that could go through a cross section of everybody, even higher ups, and even down to the lower poor person. Mm -hmm. You know, you certainly need the rich people because Jesus's grave was donated by a rich person. Yeah, but he didn't use it very long. <laughs> <laughs> he just loved it. He just borrowed it for a little while. Mm -hmm. Well, what did Paul say about how we should relate? Look at, this is Paul's comment to the Corinthians. Now remember, this is 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. Now remember what you were, my brothers and sisters, when God called you from the human point of view. Few of you were wise or powerful or of high social standing. God purposely chose what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise, and he chose what the world considers weak in order to shame the powerful. 
He chose what the world looks down on and despises and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important. This means that no one can boast in God's presence. Does God still want to do that? That seems to be God's method of operation. He mm -hmm. loves doing that. Well, in our world today, think about the world around. Think about the world we read about in the newspapers, what we watch on TV and so forth. What's the general attitudes of the educated and the worldly wise? They know it all. Well, not only that, what's their attitude about important subjects that we think are important? They, they believe in evolution. Basically, they, they you know, the, the ones who consider themselves to be very well educated, the scientists, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them think that if, you, if, you're, if you've got any smarts about you at all, you have to be an evolutionist. Yeah. And not only that, a lot of them are turning to atheism. Yeah. Atheism. And so what would they say about us? Poor ignorant people. Poor ignorant common people. Who's the guy that has um, the, oh man, I can't think. He has Lou Gehrig's disease, this, this, the scientist that's so famous. Oh yes, Hawking's. Hawking's. Stephen Hawking. He said, Christians who believe in a, 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 a something, an afterlife, are just afraid of the dark. That, that was his comment. Mm -hmm. So it's still true that a large percentage of the ordinary people in North America believe in the Bible. That, of course, isn't true in Europe, some other parts of the world. But other, some parts it is. And trying to reach out to less educated people of our generation, how can we be more user-friendly? Would it help for, to use an easier-to-understand translation, such as the Good News Bible that I use all the time, instead of the tradi traditional King James? Now, I, I can understand the King James, but... A lot of people can't. Yes. Are there any valid class distinctions in the Christian church? We do, we do not want to eliminate pastors or elders or deacons, but they are, superior. are they superior in any way? And so forth. Well, you may think of yourself as an ordinary Christian. Nevertheless, you are a unique son or daughter of God, and God will find a way to use your individual talents if you just give him a chance. God calls you and me and everyone at this table and everyone out there listening to a special challenge, to a special work that you, you and only you can do. See what you can figure out what that special work is. See you next week.